Are they believers? Yes. Oh, yeah. Been going to Mount Carmel for years. I think they went to Long Hall for a little while to get back to Mount Carmel. Hey, uh, as a youngster, kind of, well, he didn't come to this church. Vicky and them did, didn't he? Mm -hmm. The painting in the baptistry was done in memory of her father. Okay. Yeah, her father was a deacon here. Years. Any others? Oh, praise. What's what's God been doing all week? And surely he's up to something. You know, we got a lot of prayer requests. But... He's been getting me up every day. That's good. And I thank him for a blessing for every day. That's good. What else? He blesses us with a really good week with our uh, grandchildren one more time before they head back to North Dakota. That's good. of our country, God's on his own, it's not a surprise to him, he's in, he's in control, he has a plan for this, we don't know who he is, but we can trust him, we know that he's good, he's righteous, and he can only do what's right, we'll be better for it, somehow, some way, I better shut up, I'll get to preach my sermon, anything else before we pray? Lord, we are indeed just grateful that you raised us up this morning. You woke us up. We just thank you for your many blessings. You have given us health and um, a restful night of sleep, Lord. And you have given us life. You've caused us to be this morning. Our heart is beating and our lungs are taking in air and our, our brain is sending out waves just because you have willed it. So, Lord, you are good and, and a gracious and a merciful God. And we just thank you for blessing us, for feeding us and giving us fresh water today, for giving us a place to worship. Lord, for giving us your word, and we just ask that you bless it today as it goes forward. That it would not return to you void, Lord, that it would just meet us where we're at. That it would concern us with sin and conform us more into the image of Christ. 
that it would build us up and encourage us and feed our souls. Lord, we are your sheep, and we just pray that you lead us to green pasture today. Lord, we just praise you because you are worthy of praise. Even if, they're, uh, even if you're not at work in our lives, Lord, you are still worthy because of who you are. And uh, we do praise you because you have been at work. You have saved our souls, and you use us um, to, to uh, do your work and further the advancement of your kingdom. Lord, and you're just so gracious and patient, and you show your love toward us in so many ways. Uh, so we do worship you this morning. Uh, we do praise you. And we thank you for so great a salvation, Lord. Lord, we just pray for Norman and Jerry that you continue to strengthen them and build them up physically and spiritually, Lord, uh, emotionally. Lord, we just pray that you would comfort them, that you would be near to them and dear to them, that you would feed their souls during this time. Uh, Lord, that they would hunger for you and still worship you, even though their circumstances are less than ideal. Lord, we just pray that you continue to use the doctors in the rehab to minister to Miss Norma, that you would strengthen her. Lord, it's our prayer that you would be able to, and that she'll be able to go home soon, Lord, and we know uh, that her and Gerald miss each other, and they want to be around each other, Lord, and just the difficulty it must be uh, for them who have been together for over 60 years, Lord, to be apart, and Gerald is to be at home by himself, and just to be away from them, Lord, our, our hearts go out to them, and we just pray that you would reunite them quickly, Lord, and that you would just draw them close during this time. Lord, we pray for our country, Lord, we don't even know how to pray or how we ought to pray, Lord. We just know that you're God, that you are sovereign, that you're in control. We pray that your will be done and that you be honored and glorified, Lord, whatever comes about within the next couple days and even months ahead, years ahead. Lord, we just pray that you would guide our leadership, uh, Lord, and that you would use them uh, just to uh, just direct a con our country in the way that it should go. Lord, we just pray that you would change hearts, that you convict of sin, that you would draw sinners to yourself. Lord, we just pray that you raise the church up, Lord, your body of believers, Lord, that we would stand up and stand upon your word, that we would speak out, Lord, that we would make a difference, that we would evangelize and stand up for the, the rights of the unborn, uh, Lord, that we would stand up on your word for the sanctity of marriage, and Lord, that we would just be bold, that we would be Christ-like in, in our proclamation in our lives. Lord, give us courage and use your church, Lord, we just pray that you'd stave off judgment for a time, Lord honor and glorify yourself and to continue calling your people to yourself. Lord, we pray for the Todd Young family and just ask that you be with them today as they're uh, bearing loved ones. We just pray that you would comfort them, Lord, that you would just minister to them. Lord, that you would just use friends and family to bring them encouragement and comfort that you would use your word uh, that it would hopefully be proclaimed today Lord, to uh, just to add to the comfort of, of your saints. Lord, we just pray that you'd see them through this, that you'd help them to trust that you grant them the grace to, to grieve uh, as, as believers ought to grieve, Lord, and not as those without hope. Lord, just be with them today, comfort them, and just help them, uh, Lord, to look to you and to worship you even during this time of loss. Lord, we pray for Jeff, and we just pray um, that you lift our dear brother up, Lord, as he's suffering with a broken bones in his feet. We just pray that you comfort him, Lord, that you bring healing and relief to him. Lord, we just pray that this would be sanctified in him heart and his life, Lord, that he would look to you and depend on you and, and even seek to continue to serve you and to love you. Lord, we're thankful for him and, and what he does here. We just pray that you continually minister to him and his family, that he would be a blessing to others. Lord, just again, meet with us this morning. Um, humble us. Give us ears to hear. We pray that Christ would be preeminent. And it's in his name we pray. my stuff this morning. Couldn't get my printer and my computer to talk this morning, so I couldn't print out a little sheet I had and plan on using, so I'm going to try and reference it here. So today's uh, chapter of I Will, chapter 5, which is, what, can anybody tell me what this chapter focused on? I will go. Evangelism and missions, I will go, that's right. So it begins this chapter speaking about a certain church, Twin Springs Church, and um, what he talks about is the decline of Twin Springs Church. 
Does anybody recall what he kind of posited as uh, the primary reason or reasons for the decline in Twin Springs Church? So focus. No outreach. Right. So, all right. It's the lack of intentional outreach and evangelism in the church. It is the, well, he mentions the y'all come attitude. Now, in and of itself, that's, that's not a bad attitude, I don't think, because I think we've historically had that kind of here, welcoming anybody, everybody. But only having that attitude and not acting upon it to actively seek others out as well, not joining that with the missions and evangelism is not enough. So, and then the inward focus. So uh, one thing he, he mentions as part of the inward focus is that they are more worried about their comfort and needs. He says that on page 61 at the top. They focus more and more on their comfort and needs. He says the, decl- the decline was inevitable and tragic. Now regarding the uh, intentional outreach or evangelism in the community, I got to thinking, and I don't know, he doesn't mention here what programs, what they were doing or um, you know, what they may have been doing right. But what do we do here at Pleasant Hill as far as what we might categorize as our intentional outreach or evangelism? What do we do? Feed football team, it's October in Orlando. Strawberry Festival. Vacation Bible School. Nursing Home Ministry. Nursing Home Ministry. Fall Festival, we participated in parades before, um, New York, yeah. New York. The Philippines. Philippines, we've been to Nashville, Nashville, homeless, yeah. um, we do conferences here, right, every now and then we'll do a conference, men or women's conference, we have the internet, right, we're sent out, we have uh, DVDs and sermons available online, the website itself. What's that? Feeding yeah, feeding football team. Yeah, he's he's actively uh, you know evangelizing or discipling teachers at the school. It's East Robertson High School, right? It should be in our personal lives as well. So we mentioned we we just rattle off a few. Quite a few, actually, pretty quickly, of uh, what a small country church does here in a small city, Orlando, Tennessee. Um, probably one of the smallest little little cities in probably Tennessee. That's quite a lot of things. If you think if we were a congregation of two or three hundred people and we were doing this many things proportionally, it would be probably an astounding number. And so, not to say that we ought to be proud of ourselves, but we ought to, you know, every now and then take inventory. And we ought to be glad for what God is doing through us. And that we do have so many who are willing to serve, that we seek out opportunities. But, as it was mentioned, <laughs> nevertheless, we shouldn't be content in what simply the congregation as a whole is doing. Because there's a call upon us as individuals to evangelize and be on mission. And uh, what he's driving at this, in, in this chapter, is there's a corporate aspect, but importantly there is a personal aspect of evangelism and missions. He goes on in page 61. It's the uh, second paragraph under the heading, The Story is About You. He says, You see, Twin Springs Church was once full of members who made a decision to let their church be about them. Few members (laughs) invited people to church. Even fewer shared the gospel with others in the community. So, here we contrast two things. It's, it's important to be reminded that while it's good to invite others to church, and we ought to be doing that when we have opportunity and, and to seek out opportunities, there is a difference between inviting people to church and inviting people to Christ. Right? And so, sometimes we may not 
have maybe the opportunity for a uh, so-called full gospel presentation or to um, maybe witness as we kind of plan it out in our mind. And so sometimes it is simpler to simply give an, a genuine invitation to church because we feel confident, at least here at our church, that they'll hear Christ proclaimed. But we have to be careful to, uh, that there's a temptation to not witness and to simply be content and just inviting people to church uh, as if to put that, I won't say it's a burden, but there's a certain attendant fear, I think, in the back of many Christians' minds. What to say? How will I say it? Will I remember scriptures to, to share with them? What if they ridicule me? And so by simply choosing not to witness to Christ, we kind of witness to the church. Right? Yeah, that's what we pay the pastor for. Um, and so whether or not we truly think that or not, it becomes a, a temptation, right, to um, give that burden to others. We have to all be honest with that and, uh, you know, ask God to reveal our hearts, to, to reveal to us, do we have a care? Do we have a genuine desire to share the gospel? And if not, what's, what's holding us back from that and what can we do to address that head on? He says here that when a church declines, we often want to blame the pastor or the church staff or other church members or the denomination or circumstances. The reality is that church decline is the collective result of individuals who have decided they will not go. The church thus becomes a religious country club instead of an obedient Great Commission congregation. So notice the contrast between the collective of the congregation and the individuality therein. We do things as a, as a church, but as a church, we should be corporately individuals who witness the, to the gospel, who evangelize. Yes? Okay. Yeah, and that's, that's something that we ought to, to do. You're right. It's our community, and that's, that's what he gets on to in page 62, the, the Jerusalem. This is our Jerusalem, Orlando, Portland area, Cross Plains. This is our immediate context. And um, if anybody should know this area, it should be us who've been raised here, been living here for a while, and we should be able to identify those opportunities. And we don't need permission from each other to go on that mission field of across the street or to that suburb that's being built up to seek out opportunities, gospel tract, invite them um, to church, have an opportunity to maybe open up a conversation, see where, where they are spiritually, and uh, start building relationships. That may lead to further inroads in getting to the depths, the glories of the gospel. So you're right. And um, we don't know, I guess, all the ins and outs. And obviously, Tom Rayner's you know, interested in statistics and tracking kind of patterns throughout churches and congregations, especially uh, Southern Baptist. Um, and so I'm sure he's speaking from seeing these overall patterns, but we can't really, we shouldn't generalize and assume that it's always the same in every church. Some churches may have 
Um, maybe they're dealing with certain sins, particularly within that church, that they're not addressing, they're not willing to do uh, church discipline, and so God is kind of punishing that church, disciplining them, because they're not representing Christ in the community as they ought to. Um, but we know, as we'll get to here soon, that, that there is a clear teaching and command for us to witness and share the gospel. How does a church measure growth and success? How would that look like? That's a good question. Do y'all hear that? If a church is not focused on members, how do we measure church growth or success? What's an indicator of, of success for the church if we're not looking at just the membership roll numbers or, or the giving amount? You can, you can evaluate it within the individuals present in that church. A hunger for evangelism. And that, that spiritual growth is kind of a hard thing necessarily to maybe measure. We only just have a measuring stick we can take out and say, okay, you've grown this much. But I think when we pay attention, we can see people having an increased hunger for the word, increased attendance to church study sessions, outreach opportunities. Um, and I think speaking particularly to, to the witnessing, I think Jared Packer in his book, Sovereignty and Evangelism, you know, it's, it's not the methodology that is the measure of success. It is the message. Have we been faithful to proclaim the message? Because we can work up all kinds of methods, whether it's having a circus and inviting people over and handing out tracks, doing all kinds of light stuff, you know, bringing a modern band, all that. Those are all methods of attracting people to hopefully hear the message, some would say. But it's the message itself. Are we proclaiming accurately and faithfully the message of, of Jesus Christ, the gospel, knowing that that is the only means of salvation? And so I would count it a evangelistic success even if somebody rejects the message, but I have proclaimed it. Because faithfulness. faithfulness, yeah. When we look at that way, uh, I mean, I'm, I feel it this way, and I've heard it so many times, you know, is, you know, not that we should do these things to, to attract people, but that if we are proclaiming the word, um, and that's the main thing, you know. The ball is in our court to, to proclaim it, but it's out of our court uh, as far as salvation because, you know, it's God who gives the growth and God who gives salvation. And it's a great right. comfort to me, you know. It takes all the pressure off. Yeah, it takes yeah. all the pressure off, you know. Uh, I think it's beautiful, uh, uh, you know, handing out these tracks, you know, sometimes you don't think, it's going to do anything, but uh, my father was running through a pasture, jumped over a fence, and tripped over a mason jar with a Bible and a Bible tract in it and saved his soul. Because uh, somebody put a mason jar in the middle of the field. Yeah. You know? Um, yeah. Makes, makes you think of the lost treasure, finding yeah. something in the field and yeah. giving everything up to, to have that. So, yeah, and that's, that's I think something to be reminded of. that it, It's not your burden. You can't change a person's heart. But the burden is on us to give them that which does change their heart, that message, that gospel, to proclaim the name of Christ. If they reject it, so be it. You've been faithful. And, and, and God, who is the judge of all things, knows our hearts, knows their hearts, and if we've been faithful to proclaim the message he's given us to proclaim, we're walking in obedience. We're not responsible for their disobedience. I say this in great conviction in my own life, 
But if we truly love God and love Jesus and see what he's done, is it truly a burden to tell people? It shouldn't be. It shouldn't be. We get our eyes off Christ. We start living day to day, worldly concern about about money, about work, about uh, you know family concerns, which you know one day may seem trivial, but the other day they seem like everything. We you know we're all doing life, but forever, you know, Christ has risen. He is alive, um, and that's a message that needs. To Proclaimed in all circumstances, our circumstances or the person we're witnessing to. We never know what they may be going through, but we know at the end of the day we all have stood or are standing in the same place in need of Jesus Christ. So, uh, we have to at the church that every quote unquote program or, or thing we do is, is saturated with the gospel. And I think we have that here. And, and that's what we stand on, that's what we stand for, and, and that's our, our passion and our heart. Yeah. Right. And, it's not like that at other churches, like somewhere in other times. And that's not to brag. It's just um, we have the truth, and we're going to get it out there, and everything we do is geared towards that. Right. Yeah. And that's, that's, again, the true indicator of success, I think, is the gospel being taught and proclaimed. You know, many churches, especially I think really big churches, it's, it's easy to see a drive at numbers. When they've got, you know, multiple million dollar church complexes, they've got millions of dollars of debt, they have to be worried about nickels and noses. And so um, whether or not the leadership has lost sight of Christ in the gospel, you know, I can't say. We can't judge their heart. But we should be seeing fruits of the ministry that are spiritual, not earthly, not worldly. So he, he mentions at the bottom of page 62 that in a study several years ago, his team found that fewer than 10% of the churches in the United States are growing at least at the pace of the community. So most churches are not growing in step with the growth of their community. So um, as Tommy's saying, there's, there's places being built all the time. Are we taking advantage of that? Because those may be they, they may be lost, and they need to hear the gospel. Even we're saved, we need to hear the gospel every day. So, worst case scenario, they're on their way to hell. They stand judged, already condemned. They're lost. We have an opportunity to be a part of that process of salvation, giving them the message. And base case scenario, best case, they're, they're already saved, and we meet a brother or sister in Christ. All right? We don't waste our time. It's always good to find a brother or sister on the way. Page 63 says, our belief response. What then is our response? Allow me to address three major categories. Our belief response, our objections, and our actions. So these kind of, in summary, kind of made me think our belief response is our faith. Our objections makes me think of uh, our sin, our, our disobedience, and the actions needing to be one of obedience. Um, here, I think, is the, the real crux of the chapter. No believer or church member will feel compelled to share his or her faith if they don't really believe others need the gospel. In the middle, he says again, we need to settle this issue first and foremost. Do you really believe those who are not Christians need saving? Do you really believe that those without Christ are lost? That is why Luke 19.10 makes it abundantly clear for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save the lost. I fear that some of our church members only give lip service to the doctrine of lostness and to the belief that Christ is the only way of salvation. If we have no deep down belief in those truths, we will have no urgency to go. And he goes on to John 14, 1 through 6. And we're going we're to look at some passages in John. So what are your thoughts there? our belief response, and, and do we really believe that people are lost? Is that Jonah? Surely we do. People are lost. Surely we do. And uh, I personally have had a burden on my heart to speak to specific people. Um, 
All of us, yeah. Too much in the home, we need to get out more. Um, and in reading this, I, I realized that, you know, the more I'm out, the more opportunity I would have um, to share with Christ. My, not to brag or anything, but my sister in law and I were uh, in the mountains the other day and we were eating breakfast at IHA, and our waitress just seemed out of sorts, but you could tell it wasn't from her job. And so, I mean, we both noticed it separately. So we asked her about it, and her husband was at home sick. And she didn't say what of, and you know, we didn't ask. We just asked if we could pray for her. Yeah. And um, we did, and after that she told us that she had grown up in the church of Actually, her father was still a minister of church, and she said, my dad is already back. That's good. And that's all, that's all we need to do. We didn't know whether she was a Christian or not, but we felt if we prayed for her, that at least we would be ministering to her in his name. That's right. You, you felt the Lord leading you to do that, and you're faithful to. And it's whatever context we're in, whether stay-at-home mother or working nine to five. We have people we come in contact with, places we go, and uh, the smallest thing can make a difference. It may seem trivial in our sight, but we don't know how God may use it to change a person's heart, to convict them of their own sin, to remind them, uh, you know, maybe I should be reading my Bible more often, and just that one kind word or exhortation in Christ leads them to begin studying more, and uh, God uses it to draw them back into the church. So we never know, but we're to, we're to be faithful in all all circumstances. The most convicting thing about this question is do I really think that my family needs Christ? Do I really love them enough to tell them that yeah. they're a sinner and they need Christ, you know? I mean I've got brothers and cousins and aunts and uncles and grandparents that are going to die and go to hell if they don't repent. Yeah. And I sit idly by every holiday that I see them. It's hard. It's hard. I mean, yeah. we should have a more eternal outlook on life. Just thinking, you know, is this going to cause an argument on, on Thanksgiving? Or, you know, are they going to be burning in hell forever? Right, and what's more important? What's more important? And it's so easy to go to those meetings waiting for an opportunity and it doesn't happen and we're content we go on home. I know exactly, brother, because not a single person in my family outside my household has a credible profession of Christ. Um, again, our context, our Jerusalem, yeah. people we have in our lives to witness to, um, even more frightening probably too is that uh, if the gospel is not on people's hearts and minds or they're sharing it with others, but they're obviously not preaching to themselves. Mm -hmm. so chances are they're not growing. Possibly they're not even saved. I mean, they're just Christians in name only. Right. And we know as believers we need the gospel just as much as most people. You know, just to feel the sin in our lives and to just fill us with that awe and that joy that we that we'll never forget and we remember and we crucify our flesh daily and on and on and we can go, but it's, it just shows that it's just not important. It's enough to share. It's obviously not important in our own life. Right. And being reminded of the gospel every day, like you said, preaching it to ourselves. Because um, I think if you are reminded, it puts everything else, makes everything else pale in comparison. You know, it, cars not running, you know, well, Jesus Christ lives. Um, Money's not falling the way it should. Things aren't going the way it should have worked. Friends rejecting us. Whatever it is. We know that a day has been fixed in the past which, in which Jesus Christ came in obedience, fulfilled the law's demand, and went to the cross to die for us. And that, that is the greatest act of love. And it defines love um, in a way that, that history can never, in any other instance, match. 
and that we have a loving God in heaven. Um, and so, being reminded of that, the gospel, what God has done for us in Jesus Christ, in those trying times of just doing life, is a way of finding a, an application out of a deep doctrinal truth of Christ and his person at work. And we ought to be doing that. And the more we kind of fill up our own spiritual banks by doing so, the more likely we are to, in turn, share with others. Because we've been going to the Word. We've been having the gospel preached into our lives on a daily basis. And it becomes a natural thing to, in turn, now I'm not using myself as my audience, but I'm going to others and just preaching to them as I've already been preaching and teaching to myself. That's why it's important to be in, in, in the Word, in study, in church, around brothers and sisters. So... I've got a, a little bit of a study we're going to do here in John. We're going to try and rush through the rest of this chapter. And then we're going to go through and look through the book of John and jump around quite a bit. So it's page uh, 64 and 65, our response to our objections. It says, there are a number of objections we offer ourselves. They best fit in the category of excuses. Page 65, in italics, that is not my spiritual gift. That's why we don't evangelize. Or, that is what we pay our pastor and church staff to do. Or, I don't have time. Or, I don't want to impose my beliefs on others. Or, I am an introvert. Just too shy. I don't want to go out of my way to, uh, to speak or meet others in order to share the gospel. So those are some, some responses that we, we sometimes have, aren't they? I know for myself it's easiest probably to say I don't have time. I got to go do this. My schedule's so full. I'm just looking to my next, my next deadline, my next thing I got to do. And so it's easy to not slow down and make opportunities. What about you? What's, what's something, if you feel led to share, that you personally have struggled with perhaps on an ongoing basis when it comes to just witnessing to others? What are people going to think of me? A lot of times, the things I run into is, oh, I know there's God, so I'm doing it. Yeah. But it stops and, at God, yeah. Right, and that's where it stops. And, and, and one of the girls and I was talking about it at work, and, and she's a young Christian, and, and she's really starving for the Word. I mean, she, and, I mean, they are very active, and, and going to church and she studies the Bible and, and those kind of things and one of the things that we were talking about this week was just because somebody recognizes there's a God does not mean they're saved. Right. And that's a lot of times that's more of what I run into in friends and family is oh I know there's a God so it's all good. Yeah. Yeah. Most people, I think, around the world recognize a supreme being or a plurality of gods. That's, that's pretty straightforward. Most people recognize that. Natural revelation, we spoke about this. You see things, um, and our mind just seems to inherently have this, and our spirit, this draw to this reality of a divine being. But the God of the universe, of all creation, the one true God is only truly known through the scriptures, and he reveals himself uniquely, especially, most preeminently through his son, Jesus Christ. We can't look out our window and see a tree and think, oh, Jesus Christ. Now, we who have heard the gospel may see a tree and associate, oh, my Savior hung on a tree, and be reminded of a cross, because we have heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. But there's nothing in natural revelation that just, just screams to us that there is a Savior born of the Jews who was obedient under the law and did everything necessary, and that if it was not for that, we would stay in our, our current situation of condemnation and being judged. That's why I think it's important, and we Christians ought to more often use in our vocabulary Jesus Christ when referencing God than just God. There's many people who believe in God. But Jesus Christ, not the case. 
And the name of Jesus Christ has a certain power to it and has a certain truth to it that just proclaiming it somewhere can make many people feel uncomfortable because they're experiencing already, if they're not saved, a conviction. They know that, at least in our context, that Jesus Christ came. Why? Because of our sins. And he was crucified. Why? Because of our sins. That makes them uncomfortable because many people think they're all right. They're fine. They're good people. And since they know that there's a God, they're good. They have a self-righteous morality. So. Yeah, I, think, I think that just feeling inadequate, you know, like if you talk to somebody and they say, oh, yeah, I know there's God, then, okay, what do you follow up with? And just practice that, you know, even some role play just with each other to make ourselves better and more comfortable and, and be able to have a response. Uh, and a lot of times if we feel inadequate, we just think, oh, well, hey, come to church, you know, and, and leave right. it at that rather than trying to go ahead and tell them or share the gospel with them. Uh, or if they refute something we say, then we get all flustered and we don't know what to say next or where to go or, you know, what? well, I, I don't believe in Jesus. Then, you know, we could follow up with that. But, I mean, some things, some people have thoughts and ideas about that they just are foggy and we don't know how to respond to that or how to speak right. That's true. I think one good good approach is just the, uh, I don't know. We, you know, all the times there's different approaches to evangelism, right? Like the Romans Road approach. Um, you know, sometimes my approach is I ask them, do they, do they think there's truth? Just a general, well, okay, if there's truth, do you think there's a God of truth? Okay, do you think he's good? Well, how do you know that? How do you know that there's truth, that there's a good God? And then gets into me talking about scripture and ultimately going into specific truths. Because we live in a very relativistic time. But some people, like you say, will bring up objections. Well, they'll say, well, what about such and such? Which has nothing to do with probably their need for a savior. And so they try to derail the conversation and it's hard to get back on track or to know what to say to address their objections. We well, you know I read this, or I saw that, or so-and-so says this, or how do you know that? I think if you ever get in that situation where you don't know quite what to say, remember the one thing you should always probably be able to say is simply, you know, I, I think it's what John 9, the man who was healed. I, I don't know, but this much I do know, that it's Jesus Christ. Okay? He's the one who healed me. He's the one who saved me. And I know that without him I was dead and doomed, a sinner, lost. I'm no better than you, sir or ma'am, but it's because of what Christ did for me that I'm here talking to you now. Just take him to the gospel. Forget whatever approach you're going with. If you get off track, the gospel is all it is. Drop the gospel. You've been faithful. You proclaim the name of Jesus Christ and salvation. It doesn't have to look like some pretty flow chart of, of asking, answering, asking this question, getting this answer, going to this. It may not work out that way. Conversations are dynamic. But if you know the gospel and can at least drop the gospel bomb on them, then uh, you've been faithful. So. You know, Eric, sometimes evangelizing sometimes becomes kind of difficult in certain situations. I'd like to uh, I don't want to impose my belief on others in the fact that we have neighbors. And she's a Catholic and does not like the Baptist Church. Yeah. He's atheist, and they're from Connecticut. And uh, but you know, uh, you, you have to have them separated to kind of talk to them. And so now I don't see him much. But now, uh, last time I talked to him, he said, "Well, he said I'm not really saying there's not a God." So he's kind of come around a little bit of that. And uh, so I don't know how we do sometimes. The Holy Spirit opens the door. We invite them for lunch. They're going to take them out for lunch on Wednesday. And uh, you okay. know, just to pray. Some, the Holy Spirit just takes off right. and opens the door to someone. Because if I were, I don't want to offend them to the point that I hate them and want to make anything else with them. So sometimes you have to be a little careful. Yeah, you're, you're seeking to build a relationship with them in order, yeah. And that's, that's definitely an approach. And there has to be some wisdom. Um, and so long as we are, are, are sure in our mind 
that when that opportunity comes up and we're going to take advantage of it, and I'm sure you will, Tommy, to, to proclaim the gospel. Um, we do have to have wisdom. Sometimes we develop strategies and we map it out in our mind, we role play this how it's going to go, and it doesn't. And so being able to use wisdom and, and still make the best of the opportunity that God's given us. Yeah. You know, rarely is somebody going to refuse to to pray. You know. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah, and uh, you know, there's there's a balance in everything, in a sense, but there must be the priority of the gospel, right? Um, because if we don't get to the gospel, then we've left the person no better off than they were before. So whether it's praying, whether it's, uh, you know, looking for every opportunity as we build relationships, um, it needs to be, you know, our focus that we are driving to the gospel. Um, it talks about our response with actions. So our obedience, he speaks about, on page 66, 67, uh, praying for opportunities, um, inviting people to church, page 68, um, intentionally looking for opportunities, and being prepared to speak when the opportunity arises. So that's, that's getting in the mindset that there's opportunities out there. I need to be looking for them. I need to be praying for them. I need to be studying what I might say, how to say it. Um, we need to have a mindset of missions and evangelism. Even if we aren't missionaries to another country, we are in our own context here, our Jerusalem, you know, from Jerusalem, from Judea and Samaria, to the ends of the world, right? That's the scope of the gospel. That's how far it needs to go. To the ends of the earth, ends of the world, that, that includes everything. But we do have an immediate context to share it to, share with. So, um, any thoughts on that? And I'm going to try and hurry through a few passages in John. I personally have not. Has anyone looked at that app he mentions at the, the bottom of page 68? Yeah. No, I, sister, I, I hadn't. Um, all right, if you turn to the Gospel of John, which I spent maybe the last uh, almost 10 minutes looking at this. So the, the Gospel of John, you know, there's several prominent themes within the Gospel of John. Uh, which contrast belief and unbelief, or good and evil. Um, there are several expressions or metaphors repeated throughout the Gospel of John. For one thing, it's just belief and unbelief itself, those words. There's also light and darkness, referencing the good and evil, or the truth of God versus the, the lies of uh, the father of lies. So you have light and darkness. You have heart and love being used in relationship to the truth and belief and unbelief. That sometimes a person's heart is one given to, um, to lies, to evil, or characterized by unbelief, or their love is a love of the world and not of the Father. And heaven or God or the Father and the world are often contrasted with each other, that the world is characterized by, by lies, evil, unbelief, uh, rejection of Jesus Christ, um, whereas those who are obedient to God receive Christ. Um, and then there's also the obedience and disobedience that's spoken a lot of in the Gospel of John. Keeping or being in God or Christ's words, receiving his words, or not receiving his words, not abiding in his words. Those are two contrasts put in the Gospel of John. Um, a fundamental problem put forth in chapter 5 of I will go is that we don't often see or be reminded of 
the absolute need of sharing the gospel, that people are lost without Jesus Christ. So if this is the case, then Christians being strongly reminded or taught this truth may result in our greater obedience to Bible's clear command to take the gospel to others, which is missions and evangelism, whether it's in our backyard or to the utmost ends of the world. So the word heart is always used in John. There's seven instances of it in the context of either belief or unbelief, all seven times. For John, the heart functions as a clear indicator of being a genuine disciple of Christ. Either your heart is in a state of belief in Christ, and there's evidences of that, joy, peace, and obedience to God's commands, or it is in a state of unbelief, evidenced by being troubled, or tribulation without peace, and disobedience. So, uh, if we limit the context of a study of man's lostness without Christ simply to the Gospel of John, we find ample biblical teaching to support these following points. And I've got five points listed here. So this is just looking at John. We know there's 66 books of the Bible. We know Paul writes so much in his epistles, especially Romans, regarding man's lostness, uh, Jesus Christ's work, um, all those important theological truths. But uh, in the Gospel of John, one point is that man exists in a state of unbelief and sin. Man exists in that state of unbelief and sin. Um, number two, man's state of unbelief and sin is deserving of condemnation and judgment. So we exist in this state of unbelief and sin, and in that state of unbelief and sin, we deserve judgment. We deserve con to be condemned. That is our state. Point three, man's solution is found outside of himself. It's in Jesus Christ, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Number four, man's heart changes through the gospel as evidenced by new joy, love, obedience, and possession of the Holy Spirit. And five, man's newfound obedience includes many things, including missions and evangelism. As we're running short on time, we're going to summarize this. We'll look at John uh, 3, 16 through 21. Should be a familiar passage. There's, there's much here to be discussed. So I'll read for us John 3, 16 through 21. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world. And people loved the darkness rather than the light, because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light, and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. So we see that man exists in a state of unbelief or sin. Verse 18, Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already. Man has a state of unbelief in which he's already condemned. Um, and that also addresses... A point two, which is man's state of unbelief and sin is deserving of condemnation and judgment. It are, says it clearly there, that those who are already in a state of unbelief, they're condemned already. Why? Because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God, verse 18. Point three is man's solution is found outside of him, in the gospel of Jesus Christ. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. That's the solution right there. The Son of God, Jesus Christ. And man's heart changes through the gospel as evidenced by new joy, love, obedience, and possession of the Holy Spirit. So, verse 21, But whoever does what is true comes to the light so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. Um, the context, you know, this is just following up with the conversation between Jesus and Nicodemus. And one of the things that Jesus brings up in that conversation is the wind, being born from above. Reference, it's an indirect reference, but a reference to the Holy Spirit. 
Um, it's not explicitly said here, but as we get later on in John, there are very many passages, especially as you get to John 14, 15, 16, 17, um, where it speaks about the Holy Spirit coming, the helper, that when Jesus goes to the Father, that he will send the helper. Um, and so the Holy Spirit is the one who empowers us and brings with him um, a new joy and also obedience. And that we uh, undertake works for God. Let's see here. Let's turn over, it's like John 14. A lot that I thought I might be able to get to say, but we had I think, a lot of great conversation, a lot of good points made, so i try and just hit some of the, the highlights of this. You know, many people will go to the Gospel of John, or put that as probably one of the, if you just had one book that to have another person read, the Gospel of John often, for many, is that book, that if someone's lost, they would read the Gospel of John, because it, it, it's so clear throughout John, man's state of lostness, and how Jesus Christ is that solution to that problem. In John 14, or verse 6, John 14, 6, as Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So he's very clear. Okay, that's not a passage which opens us up to uh, some kind of moral relativity or divine relativity, that there's some other gods out there, some other truth. There is a certainty that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Verse 15 of, of chapter 14 says, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans, I will come to you. So, they're speaking of the Holy Spirit, the gift. And, um, let's see. It's a passage in which Jesus speaks of us doing greater things than he had done because he will be in us. And if you follow Jesus' teachings throughout, especially these chapters, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, uh, chapter 15 is the passage concerning Jesus being the true vine, us being the branches. Jesus makes it clear that he's doing these things, that we may have joy, that we may have possession of the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit will be in us, and that in that same way, through the Holy Spirit, we have a unity with God, the Father and the Son. There's a Trinitarian reality and presence in believers, and it is through us that God is moving and working to save others, and that we are being sent to others. So, and the whole purpose of the Gospel of John, in chapter 20, verses, I think it's 31, 32, um, let me look on that, yeah, John chapter 20, verses 30 and 31, that the Gospel of John was written so that others may believe in the only true living Son of God and have eternal life in His name. That's the purpose of the Gospel of John. If it was not needed, if there was not a need for the Gospel, if there was not a need for Jesus Christ to, to do all that He did, to, to come, to live the perfect life, to die on the cross, to reveal this truth, to indwell believers, to command believers to go out and share the Gospel, then uh, we are rejecting a very fundamental message of all of Scripture, and especially of just the Gospel of John itself. So, we need to be reminded that there, and that's just looking at the Gospel of John, just a few quick passages. There's so much throughout the New Testament, especially. And we should not, I guess, grow complacent in that. We need to be reminded and put things in eternal perspective that there are people who need the Gospel. And Jesus Christ has brought it to us that we may bring it to others. So, any thoughts before we close out? All right. I'll pray for us, then we'll be dismissed. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are a loving God, the one true living God. And God, you saw fit to save us, and not because of our righteousness, not because of our goodness, 
and, and some kind of works, Father, but because of the goodness and the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Father, we're thankful that you have loved us with an everlasting love, a steadfast love which endures forever, fixed not upon us or our failures, but upon the perfect obedience and righteousness of Jesus Christ, which will never go changed. He is today, as he always has been, perfect, and he forever will be. He's our, our reason for hope, our reason for love, and uh, he is the one true object of our faith. God, please empower us, fill us with your Holy Spirit, that we would go to others, we would proclaim the gospel, whether we do it, uh, Father, with boldness or meekness, but that we would proclaim the gospel truth, because others need it. And may we be faithful to heed your call. Be with Brother Rick as he preaches this day. Father, we pray that you'd speak through him, give the words to say, and Holy Spirit, convict us of our sinfulness, convict us of truth, convict us of righteousness. Holy Spirit, uh, comfort us as well, because the gospel is an amazing truth, the one truth. And we pray that we would always be growing closer to you and the love of your son, Jesus Christ, as we further our understanding of the gospel. May you be glorified this day. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.